Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's been a while since we've looked at the doctrine of Christ, but hope it's a subject that's been on our minds, even though we haven't looked at it, because it is quite an important subject. And I realized that there was one thing in the life of Christ that I didn't cover, that I want to touch on at least before going on to his death. I want to read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The part of this I would like us to think on and consider at this time is that in his humanity, he was a man of sorrows. a man of sorrows and a man acquainted with grief. Now, I'm sure we've all met them. These great so-called witnesses for Jesus, preachers, whatever. Always running around with a obviously pasted in fake smile on their face. Always happy in Jesus. Isn't that what that one old song says? The only one way to be happy in Jesus. And what's that? Rest in his grace? No, trust and obey. Do your duty. Be a good, unprofitable servant. What I'm getting at here is he was a man of sorrows. He wept over the death of Lazarus. He looked out over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together? He was sorrowful. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I'm not saying we have to be long-faced as the stereotypical Puritan or anything like that. I don't believe we are. But I think as we are not to be different We're not above, as servants, we're not above our Lord and Master, are we? If he was a man of sorrows, we should be too. Sorrowful. Look at how it describes him. 
He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. What's that telling us? That in the man Christ Jesus, there is nothing in his appearance, nothing in the flesh that he bore that would cause us to want to follow him, to even want to come to him, to even want to listen to him. What? We hid, as it were, our faces from him. For he was despised. And what? And we esteemed him not. All we got to do is look at how the Jews treated him. How knoweth this man letters having never learned? They esteemed him not because all they looked at was, is this not the carpenter's son? It's not his mother and his brethren still here with us. We know all about this Jesus. They knew some things about the human nature of Christ, didn't they? They knew some things about that man. But what they did not know was that that man was not the carpenter's son. Joseph was not his father. God was his father. And he was the son of God, begotten and generated by him. All they saw was another man. There was nothing in him by nature, nothing in the flesh, nothing in outward appearance that would cause you to be drawn to him, that would cause you to, as I said before, even listen to him. But he taught as one having authority, and not like the scribes and Pharisees. They didn't teach with authority because they knew they had none. Who was this that had no form nor comeliness? Who was this? There was no beauty. Who was this man of sorrows? This was the Word, the eternal Word, made flesh to dwell among us. to be the sin-bearer, to be tempted. See, brethren, you get the ideas by listening to Arminian religionists? And you know, I don't, I don't mean to pick at them. All they've got is what God gave them. But most so-called Calvinists are really just whitewashed Arminians. They've got this idea that they present of this victorious Jesus. There he is, by golly. Just standing in the midst with, as it were, the wave of his hand, whipping aside them temptations. I mean, you know, think about it. You, you, you that uh, old enough or maybe foolish enough, I don't know, to remember all those stupid kung fu movies from China and all, you know, they just flick their enemies out of the way. Well, that's the way they want to portray Jesus in his temptations. And I'm not just talking about that temptation in the wilderness as recorded by our synoptic gospel writers. I'm talking about the temptations he bore throughout his life because he was tempted in all points like as are we. And that made him sorrowful. Though he did not succumb to the temptation, what do you think it meant to him knowing 
that you and I would. When we are overcome by temptations in this life, yes, it is a blessed thing to think that my Jesus has overcome that in my place. And I thank thee, Father, that if I am indeed thine and covered by his blood, that that is not laid to my charge. And I pray not to go through it again and all of these things and that I might not fall. Does it make you sorrowful? Are you grieved by it? Brethren, we claim to have the correct doctrine. And I believe we do, for the most part. As much as man can be correct, we've got it. We've got the correct doctrine. But what does it do for us? Well, it saves us from hell. It makes us fit for heaven. No, the blood of Jesus Christ makes us fit for heaven. His imputed righteousness gives us what we need. The doctrine doesn't. I'll submit to you if the doctrine does not affect us. Well, that we're just holding it in the head and it has nothing to do with the heart. I'm reminded of Job who goes through his a little soliloquy there against his friends, so-called. Tells them how great the Lord is, how he's predestined everything. And he says, when I consider, I'm afraid. Job was afraid. He was fearful. He knew the truth. And he saw the truth. He knew who afflicted him. The Lord may have used the devil to, did it, to do it, but the affliction came from the Lord, did it not? He was fearful. He was afraid. Does it make us afraid? Or does it make us overly self-confident? Let's not be like those who say, by golly, I got the truth. You want it, you come to me. Well, brethren, we got the truth. If you want it, you go to the Bible. You study that. And you know it. Then when you hear the truth from someone like me or someone else, you know, I ain't saying I'm the only one that's got it. Don't get me wrong. Then that witness inside you will say, that's the truth. That's the truth. You ever been sitting in a meeting, heard the preacher, and something inside you said, that's the truth. I never could express it like that. Never heard it like that expressed. But I know that's the truth. Because it witnesses to my soul. Brethren, he was a man of sorrow. And acquainted with grief. Do we expect to be any different? <laughs> I remember back in, in my Armenian days, people talk about being overcomers. Oh, yeah, we're going to be overcomers. 
we got to get rid of that uh, down in the dumps. We got to overcome. Boy, they tell you how to do it too. You got to set you aside. A prayer time, a Bible reading time. You got to get a witnessing time. You got to do this, this, this. My goodness, they keep you so busy. Didn't have time to think about how sinful you are and what a great Savior Jesus is. Yeah, the Bible talks about overcomers. How did they overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. What was first? Jesus' blood. If you've been sprinkled with that blood, if you've been washed with it, if you've seen that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, you're going to be an overcomer. And by the word of their testimony, by the word of their witness, that's how they overcame. You know, God's children rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. But he was the man of sorrows. And we are too if we're following him. If we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus, if we're walking the path that he's marked out for us to tread, if you hear that voice in your ear behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, if you've set your face toward Zion thitherward, if you're looking for a city which hath foundations, whose maker and builder is God, and I'm not talking about an earthly city. I'm not talking about the New Testament church. I'm talking about that great city, New Jerusalem. In there, what does it say? God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. What else does it say about that, brethren? Well, a lot of times my memory isn't the best in the world. I know what uh, I know what the basis. I know I can tell you what what it says, but I'd I'd like to read it in this case. And I heard a great voice. Well, let's start with verse 1 of Revelation 21. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Listen now. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Jesus was a man of sorrows, but we're only told he wept once. He wept over Lazarus. Now, my question is on that. You know, we cry about a lot of things. Some of y'all may know that I'm a musician, and I like a lot of folky-type country music, and there's a song by Guy Clark called the Randall Knife. 
minute he he's talking about the death of his father and he said he couldn't find a tear he says I've cried for many lesser things whiskey pain and beauty and that's us we'll, we'll shed a tear if we feel if we're hurt we'll shed a tear when we think something's beautiful have you ever listened to Maybe a symphony orchestra, maybe a choir, maybe just a bunch of old hard shells out in the backwoods singing. And it moved you to tears because you think it's beautiful. Tell you what, when I haven't been around a bunch of hard shells singing and I hear them, most of the time I won't shed a tear. heard the gospel the beauties of the gospel have you shed a tear for that most of the time we're crying over worldly things Jesus wept when Lazarus when he went to see them because Lazarus had died Mary Martha We're told by most expositors that he was crying over Lazarus when it said Jesus wept. Was he? Now Jesus had not yet come into town but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out followed her saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept, and the Jews said, Behold how he loved him. I'll submit to you, he wasn't just crying over Lazarus. His weeping was also over Mary and Martha and the Jews that were there who were weeping with them. Why? Because they had no faith? Think about it. Think about it. But anyway, back to 22nd chapter, or 21st chapter of Revelation for just a brief moment. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief, that man who wept, that man who was troubled and groaned, Looked at Jerusalem, said, I'd have gathered you as a hen gathered her chicks. I'd gathered your children as a hen gathered her chicks, but you would not. He'll wipe away all tears from your eyes. Whatever they were for. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. That's what that man of sorrow has brought in for us. Surely he hath borne our sorrows. His sorrows were ours. That's why it says, casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. You can't bear your sorrows. You can't bear your care. You know, people who do that, wind up on prescription pills. People who do that wind up under the care of 
psychiatrist, people who do that, show their lack of faith in Jesus because they will not cast their care upon him. They will not. They want to keep it. Jesus bore your sorrows. Jesus took your sin. They weighed him. They weighed on him. But he carried them. All the way to the cross. And when he was nailed there, the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way. Covered, as it were, with his blood. And it's no longer for us. He was sorrowful as a man under the law. He was acquainted with grief. There was no beauty in him that we should desire him. But when it's revealed by Almighty God to you who he is, who he was, and what he shall be forever, you can't help it. Somebody asked me, are you a can't help it Baptist? Amen, I am. I can't help it. I had to be. Had to be. The natural man receiveth not the Spirit, the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Until God comes to you and reveals Jesus as the one mediator between God and man, that man, Christ Jesus, We have no hope. But when he becomes our hope, when he's formed in you the hope of glory, oh, brethren, then we rejoice in what he's done. Then we can weep that we're such foolish beings that even though God has become our God and he has become our Savior we would still go on and sin. Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. And brethren, I'm right behind him. right behind him. And it grieves me. And I can only imagine what it must have been like to have borne the sin and the temptation for not one person, not even just one group of people, not for a family. Well, it is a family, and it is a group, but you know what I mean, an earthly family. But for the sum total of all of the elect, from Adam to the last, how much sorrow did that encompass? How much grief did he have? Does it tear at your heart? Does it make you want to, what's the word I'm looking for? The world would call it reformation. Reformations of the flesh. No, the gift of God is repentance, a changed mind. 
There's only one way you get that, and that's God give it to you. Well, I've rambled enough for now. I hope the Lord would bless you to consider these things, and we'll move on as the Lord wills. <laughs>